assignments I've seen haven't been maximum effort by the major leaguers. True. I saw Keith Hernandez do a rehab in Miami, and he went 0 for 5 in a 12 to 10 game. <laughs> uh, I saw Charlie Nagy pitch a rehab game in Akron for the Cleveland for rehab for the Cleveland Indians and got bombed. You know, it's like so. It's yeah, still I had my cool, chance to see a major leaguer not try very hard, just work mm -hmm. on his mechanics. You know. <laughs> we, we, Ledger, and Ledger and I were talking, talking about, about that, that earlier. earlier. That's, That's one, one of the, of the things, things I don't, I don't even know if I should bring it up when, 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 when I, I uh, talk, talk, hopefully, talk hopefully talk about the Jumbo Shrimp is in their Hall of Fame, fame which they have Hank Aaron, Aaron, they have, they have like Tom, Tom Seaver, um, Randy Johnson, just guys that played for Jacksonville for a year or so. Yeah. But one of the guys who's in it was Edgar Martinez. You know what his length of tenure was down here? It was a rehab assignment that you just spoke of. Really? Is that all? He played, I think, three games. So he spent and three he's days. In the Hall of Fame. Just he's because in the, he's... the Jacksonville Hall of Fame. Because he really is in the Hall of Fame. He's so an ex Hall of Famer wanna, and he's in the Hall of Fame. They want to claim right? him. They want to claim do. him. Yeah. yeah, that kind of drives me nuts. But well, it's a pretty, it's an incredibly impressive list when you look at it. it. You know, who's played here and. and in past years, I mean, it's a pretty good list just for the time Kershaw. I've been here. But it's but before that, it was really luminaries, and you wonder really how much of a role they had here. Yeah, it was Kershaw. Kershaw's up there, which surprised yeah. me. I I did not remember that. Um, that Jacksonville was a Dodger affiliate. I don't remember. Well, I happened the first year, first couple of years I was here, they were Dodger affiliates, maybe longer than that. And I happened to get season tickets one year. Just uh, it's really nice ticket plan where whatever tickets you didn't use, you could group together later for a, a group. You know, how to get all that? Pick your seat. So uh, <clears throat> I think I actually bought one ticket, one season ticket, knowing I would not go to all the games and would you know use the excess uh, for a variety of purposes to take take a friend sometimes mm -hmm. and so forth. Anyway, that ended up being the year that as a Dodger affiliate, the Miami, one of the Jacksonville Suns were uh, Baseball America's minor league team of the year. Yeah. Russell Martin was catching. James Loney was at first. Andy LaRoche was at third. Del Wynn Young was at second. Guzman was shortstop. The pitching staff was Billingsley and Broxton and uh, Edwin Jackson and Hanrahan and another guy who made it to the majors, Eric Stultz. Uh, there might have been another major leaguer. Plus, uh, they had uh, one or two major league outfielders who were not stars in the majors. Billingsley, I think, team. was – yeah, Billingsley, I think, was as highly regarded, maybe more so than Kershaw coming up. And, at and the time, at the time, there were – Dodger got diehard Dodger fans who thought this is the next uh, Koufax and Drysdale. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think he had <clears throat> arm trouble, but um, I'm not sure if he was if well, he was effective as he, he, never, as he got up he there. He never really had excellent years, and even that year, he was, uh, I think, working on his curveball an awful lot. He could have blown away hitters and didn't do it. Um, throwing too much. Too much other stuff, but you know yeah. that's part of what part of what minor league ball is. It's development. Yeah, absolutely. It's hard to project um, high school kids, and I think both of those were drafted out of high school. They didn't know college at all, so and it's not like college ball taxes them. They used to think that they were burning out pitchers, but it's probably more the high school coach, uh, the high school yeah. season, that they're burning them out at too young of an age. Um, <clears throat> Kerry right. Wood, the the number of innings he pitched. Um, the guy whose bio I'm trying to finish, John Henry Johnson. Uh, one of the news, the interesting things I got from his high school career was he pitched, um, I think it was 14 innings of a 17 inning game. He didn't get the decision that wow. another pitcher did. Wow. Struck out like 17 guys. And Tom Tango has like a pitch uh, calculator because they didn't keep pitch counts, certainly not in high school line scores or box scores. And you could do a calculation based on innings pitch, strikeouts, walks, uh, approximately how many uh, pitches the guy must have thrown. And I think yeah. it was about 170, 170 wow. pitches. That's Kerry Wood-esque. Uh, 
they hammered his high school coach. They blamed Dusty Baker for ruining him, but that high school coach didn't help. Well, and they got a state title, though. You know, you hear every now and then someone talk about babying pitchers that Mickey Lowich <laughs> threw 325, 340 <laughs> innings, you know, 900 innings in a year. And it's like, yeah, but for every Mickey Lowich, there's five or ten guys who threw the most innings in their life and they were never the same after that. Yeah, there was no free agency. They had to uh, plug 300 plus. And you look at the back of uh, Gaylord Perry's baseball card and how many innings pitched he went yeah. through year after year after year, always 300 plus. He pitched 32 uh, games or thir- and well, back then it was 40. Now it's yep. 32. You, yep. you yep. pitched every fourth game, not every fourth day, every fourth game. However, the however that would uh, line up, and guys would pitch over three hundred was was yep. probably expected from your number one guy. Well, you know, I did a study once on what I called the myth of the four man rotation. Um, after the dead ball era, I mean, you can start from nineteen twenty forward, and you know, you have to define what is a four man rotation. There's different ways to look Mm -hmm. at that. I chose to define it as three pitchers got three-fourths of the starts. And then if it was an army of 25 other guys who started, Mm -hmm. that makes up your fourth start. Yeah. Okay, so that seemed to be go over well with the Sabre group I was writing to at the time, uh, although others have taken different positions of what what constitutes the four-man rotation. And – I found that from 1920 forward and forward to that point was probably very late 1990s or it started 2000. Uh, Certainly wouldn't have changed since then. There were something like three or four teams Mm -hmm. that qualified on that basis. And one of them was the 70 two, I think, White Sox who had three knuckleballers in their rotation. <laughs> so, pitch every Wilbur third Red day. and uh, Bonson Negro. and Bradley. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so those guys, you know, were able to pitch a lot more as knuckleballers always have been. The Dodgers had one in the Sutton years, you know, where everybody pitched a lot. But <clears throat> it just, you know, that's why I call it the myth of the four-man rotation, if you accept that definition as a legitimate way to look at whether there really was a four-man rotation. Yeah, I think it was four, four and a half, or really it was five guys. And if the if there were a rain out or something where the number one guy could take the spot where the number four or five guy would be in a position to pitch, that guy got bumped again. And the number one guy, I guess, was going back, was going back and pitching. I don't, I don't know that they were burning out the second or third guy as much, but the number one guy was getting it, was getting his 40 starts and the twos. I mean, the Mets rotation, it seems like those guys pitched like clockwork, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And there had to have been a five guy, but um, when they had um, Seaver, I think it was Kuzman, Matt Lack and Gentry, Gentry might've, might've been early and Matt Lack later, but they had, they had a big four and didn't deviate from it too much. I, I think Nolan Ryan at one time was their five guy because he was always going back and forth to the Marines or the reserves rather. And yeah, well, part of the, part of the problem with, you know, or part of the issue I should say with the uh, way I defined it is, you know, it's tough for a team to get through with three regular starters and then the rest with all the double headers they played. And then of course, if, somebody got injured. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't necessarily by intention that they decided they needed five, six, seven, eight starters. Um, Inevitably, some teams who would have liked to have gone with fewer starters had somebody getting bombed early in the year and, you know, just couldn't stand it any longer. Some of the miners had traded them or released them. Uh, So there's lots of reasons why a team wouldn't do that. But from 1920 till the end of the century is a lot of teams. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there just, just wouldn't really almost any qualifying under that criteria. I wanted to ask you before we get um, to something that 
Well, I think maybe Leader would be interested in another Marlin thing is the, the bio that I'm doing with John Henry Johnson, I submitted the first draft and I got it back. Well, um, Bill Nallen wrote, well, what has he done for the last um, 30 years of his life? He covered from, you know, childhood to age 32. And that's when he flamed out his major league career. And I didn't find anything. It, oh. he's literally disappeared from the face of the earth. The only thing we found was his Facebook site, which it is his, and it says married to so-and-so, not even a date. Check public records, Sparks, Nevada, which is near Reno and all that stuff. And I don't know if half the marriages there are public record or not, right? They, they're drive-through um, casinos or whatever. But there is literally nothing. And I told Bill, I said, it seems like this guy is a bit of a recluse and just maybe had a bad taste in his mouth from baseball and just didn't discuss it. He didn't go to a high school reunion that uh, honored, you know, the guys who played there of which he was one of them. In fact, he was a major one, one of two in baseball and he wasn't there. There was no, you know, newspaper accounts of him, you know, going to anything like uh, a show or an old timers that he just disappeared off the baseball map. And so had he, I mean, what do you fill that with other than we could say, well, he married so-and-so, but we don't even know when. No, first of know. all, first of all, I would uh, try to contact him. You got a we Facebook. Did. We did. Okay. He didn't so, reply? Yeah. No, well, not today. Not, you know, I'll try the wife or the supposed wife, but Bill gave me a name of three um, guys from the Nevada area. And I added three of the guys from Sonoma High School and they haven't come up with anything. In fact, how long has it been month. since you've contacted week. these people? A week. I'm going to, that's what I want to follow up. But what do you do? I, it still has all the, you know, feel of this guy's just went recluse and maybe had a negative um, feel for well, his Well, you might want to contact, want you might want to contact the Red Sox or the Rangers, whoever else he pitched yeah. for. And the A's and, and the Giants. So what, uh, what do you have, you know, in the way of alumni contact information? Or can you get to them? That's a thought. Uh, what I'm trying to do is the following, you know, this is positive. This is, yeah. you know. No, and, I told, that's what I told him. I said, I was a fan of the Giants back then. And I was excited when he was in the minors. That was like Diaquisto, Falcone, Montefusco, Halicki. They were... Yeah. It seemed like they were cranking out pitchers every year. He was one of them. He was at the tail end of that. They would have had quite, you know, a rotation and, and quite a staff. But then they trade him for Vida Blue, and Vida Blue tops off the staff at that point. So well, you, you might have more luck with whatever team he pitched for last. Um, yeah, I think it was the And I, that's where I'd go first. And second, I'd go for whatever team he pitched for most. Uh. Mm. <laughs> He was two, three years max with anybody. And you have so, nothing to lose by contacting both of those teams at the same time. You don't have to yeah. worry about a protocol here. But I, explain what you're doing. Oh, yeah. And, I, no, I did in the thing to him. I said I was a okay. fan, and I just want you know you to look it over, and maybe if you see any corrections or anything that's objectionable, we'll change it. If I'd like for him to add stuff, but um, the post-career stuff, but... You know yeah, I, mean? I think I think it's fine to tell them you're trying to fill in some gaps of, uh, you know, fans. The fans would like to know about him now. Yeah. If he doesn't give a shit about fans and doesn't want to have any conversation, that's fine. You know, I met Marty Castillo when his wife had dragged him to our church, <laughs> and uh, and you know, talking with Marty, and he used to have a bar, and after played ball, and and players would come to the bar and all that. But he, he said he really liked to talk about baseball very much, you know, his yeah. career. That's what everybody wanted to talk about was him as a ball player. And he'd spent more years not as a ball player. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Every time he started the conversation with me, he was talking about baseball. <laughs> so on one hand, he wasn't welcoming starting the conversation. But, you know, whenever he did, he was saying, oh, boy, have you you see Felix Hernandez pitch. That guy's really great, you know. Uh, or he told me a story about how he became a catcher. That uh, he'd been a third baseman on the Tigers World Series winning team, and uh, part-time third baseman who had a really good throwing arm was a better fielder than a hitter. 
And he really didn't produce the kind of offense you'd want from a third baseman mm-hmm. playing team. And he said that Sparky Anderson came to his hotel room one time with a catcher's glove. <laughs> and uh, he said, you're a catcher from now on. And Marty said, no, I'm not. I'm not <laughs> that's, that's crazy. I had no interest in being a catcher. And uh, – Sparky said something to the effect of, well, you could be a major league catcher, you could be a minor league third baseman. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so. That's what the veterans, will t- uh, I mean, they knew that. Nowadays, they, guys are like, I made enough money, I'm not doing that. But back then, it was a way to hang on and get a few more years at better money than driving a beer truck. They used to, well, know, and if, like it's, that. if it's all you know and you really like the environment of being in a major mm-hmm. league team, you know, and the guys you're with and the the semi-celebrity or more than that you have the, the the limelight you know and all that playing under those lights with fans and all that kind of stuff and you know that it's not going to last for a real long time you know even even if if you are making good money it's kind of like uh well nobody's going to pay me this afterwards true and that was true back in the 70s i mean they, you, you see the salary figures and you, you say oh my god compared to what they're making now yeah. Those guys were working for peanuts, but we as fans were still like, you know, you're making five or not 10 times. I think it was three to five times what um, regular blue collar worker was making. And that was considered obscene at the time before free agency. And now it's, it might be a hundred times the. Yeah. And the you look at, uh, in fact, if you go back before free agency, even a little later than that, you see guys who are great players the last couple of years of their career were they were bums mm-hmm. statistically you know they were hanging out they you have to rip the uniform off my back because you know I, this is the best life i've ever had and, and it's the best maybe i'm going to have now some some guys have real business acumen and and educations and ambitions but they're a minority you know, the person who becomes a dentist or a, owns 22 car dealerships or whatever it is that would make them wealthy in their own right, those guys are are more infrequent. Becomes a dentist after leaving Major League Baseball? It's happened. It's happened, yeah. Wow. I think, uh, you know, Maris? Major League careers being rather short. You know, when, when you're retiring at age 35, 38. Still, that's a lot, a lot of, to go through dental school. A lot of career. Well, I think he'd already been through dental school. You know, at least he had his college degree. You know, dental school after that is going to be a few years. But you start a second career at age 40, you have a pretty long career yet. I think after uh, car dealerships, didn't like Maris and a couple other guys make a ton of money uh, with beer distributorships? Yeah, Maris was was a beer distributor, had a beer distributorship. Mel Farr, the football player for the Detroit Lions, one of the I best remember. running backs in the mm-hmm. Lions franchise history, uh, owns a lot of car dealerships or did them. Yeah. I think Elway is big uh, in, in the Denver area, Colorado. Yeah, I think Gunnaway. so too. I think so too. He's I thought they all opened restaurants. That too, yeah. That might that might be up there too. Because it, you could be the, you're the front man. You're the, the guy, uh, the meter and greeter and Beer is the same. Is, I guess selling beer is the same thing, or trying to get positioned in the stores. And car dealer, I mean, you're going to stay in a car dealer where you get a chance to take a picture with John Elway or get his autograph if he's there. I don't know if he's there running them, but somebody in the Elway family must be, <laughs> and they must have some memorabilia to give out. Well, the other thing I think the Marlins were in the news for were. Uh, which is going to be good for them, I guess, uh, from a PR standpoint, is hiring that, uh, is it Kim Ng? Yes. The general man, or she was assistant general manager, I think, for the Dodgers, or, uh, or was it the Dodgers or the Mets? I think, I think maybe the Mets. But, a step, yeah, step away. But, from, uh, yeah, already there's been a lot of publicity about that. Not just the mention, you know, but starting to look into her career and interview her. Uh, we have um, 
who was it, Tim Tebow, and who else became part of the ownership of the Iceman? Oh, oh yeah, the, the hockey, the hockey team. team. Yeah. 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 Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that happened earlier days in ago. the week. Yeah. Earlier in the week, like my, I think it was announced Monday. I yeah, forget who the other guys, guys were, were, the other yeah, celebrities. I wonder, I wonder why Tebow got involved with that. He doesn't have a hockey background, obviously, and he... Uh, he had baseball, but not... Yeah. yeah. Right. Baseball, well, yeah, football, yeah, the, the, the Sharks. The, uh, and he's arena. got a, you know, Tebow's got a very, very interesting and active ministry. Mm-hmm. You know, so I don't know that he has a whole lot of time for the Iceman and and maybe it's a friend he wants to help out. Yeah. I could see, see him doing the arena team, team though, the football. And he's also, you know, he's also doing broadcast work on ESPN. Yeah. So he's, his he time married this universe. His time is pretty, com yeah, his time is pretty, pretty committed, I would think. It's not like he's just lending his name to those other things. He's really involved in that ministry work and in the, and the ESPN work. Oh, I'm sorry. We do have somebody else in the waiting room. I'm not sure how long they've been here. Joseph Jordan. Joseph T. Jordan. Yeah. Oh, Joseph. Joseph, do you have your mic unmuted? Or can you hear us? It's not giving me the option to unmute, but here, wait a minute. Let me try unmute all. Yeah, I think he's still buffering in. Joseph, can you hear us? Or maybe he just left. He's connecting to audio. There we go. Okay. Mary. There we go. Mary, was it you and I who were talking a few meetings back about that uh, Dave Rader play where he caught a <laughs> and doubled off a guy at second base and you wondered about the infield fly rule? Yeah, we were talking about that, yeah. Oh. You know, it occurred to me, the infield fly rule only applies if two or more men are forced. So yes. if you're just on second base, there's infield pop-up. No infield fly. There's, there's no infield fly rule. There's got to be men at first and second or uh, first, second, and third. Sense. That makes yep. sense. The assumption is that the batter's got to run out his hit. You know, that, that, that's not something you can trap them on. Right, that uh, makes sense. And that if you're only going to get one out, then you could have got that in the first place by catching it, you know. So it's a ploy to get two outs. Right. Joseph Jordan, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hate to catch you in mid-sip like that. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> now we have a quorum. We can conduct business instead of just so – it's a social meeting at this point, end of year meeting. <laughs> so you're up in is it are you massachusetts i'm baltimore tell us a little about yourself do the fight uh, song thing <laughs> um avid baseball fan um, um pull a little bit for the orioles since they're here um uh, uh truck driver <laughs> um, nice same enough. Um, wife and two kids. Um, and a uh, group of Braves fans because it was a group in Richmond. Uh, so they had the Richmond Braves at the time. They are they are now the Richmond Flying Squirrels. I'm not sure. I love it. Giants affiliate. Are they still going to be a Giants affiliate? I believe they're going to stay a Giants um, affiliate. Um, I think, was it double A? Yeah. It was, yes, they were double A. Yeah. Yep. So, so it's what is it a contest to see if they have the stupidest names? No, no, no. Everyone I'm thought sorry. the jumbo shrimp was stupid, and it was uh, I it was a commercial success. It's marketing. I love the Suns. I thought that was such a great name. It's it's uh, it's ear catching, I suppose, and it gets their name. It gets free publicity nationwide, but you know, people from around the nation aren't going to your games. But um, yeah, every year it seems like somebody's coming up with the most. I think one of them got turned down recently. Um, I don't know if Major League Baseball has approval on it. If they don't, they will now. But some of them are are close to outrageous. But they thought well, the jumbo shrimp. I was 
about a year and a half ago, I guess it was, I was talking to the owner of a couple of minor league franchises. I think he had, might have had uh, the Modesto A's or somebody. He definitely had the uh, El Paso Chihuahuas. <laughs> and uh, and he was saying, you know, ever since they adopted the name the Chihuahuas, you know, they're selling merchandise in 50 states. Yep. That's really? the name of the game now. Yeah. That's so, you know, you get this, you get this cute logo, you know, this crazy logo and, uh, and an odd name and people collect it as a, you know, as a novelty. But and, I remember uh, when it first switched over a few years ago, I think the overwhelming sentiment at that time was negative. I didn't find any traditionalist who liked it. They hated it, but I knew what it was. I knew it was a, you know, anybody who's going to be a fan now has to switch from their son's jerseys and caps, right? They have to buy new stuff. And, uh, and then there was this, you know, 50 state marketing thing. Now, I don't know how many they sell around the world, but it's enough to want to do this stuff. Well, and they said they would they get would crushed, crushed, and they, and they said, said attendance, attendance would be down so much, and no, I think it was up. It was up. Has, that has no influence on. So the I mean, the motive behind the switch was marketing for, for nationwide mar marketing. Well, nationwide, but also locally, you're going to sell yeah. new more yeah, caps and shirts, right? Everything. I mean, all the logo stuff. You know, the old logo. You, we're going to go to the stadium with the with a logo that's two years old. So you might, if you don't have any more money and this is what you'd rather have, but for the most part, if you want to show the colors of your team, mm, you know, you get the, get the new stuff. Though. I mean, major league teams do this. Major league teams adopt a jersey for a game or for several games in a year. They have the throwback they, jerseys. The they have the mm -hmm. throwback jerseys from the 70s, the throwback jerseys from the 40s. They have different practice jerseys different colors for home games. College football teams do that now. You know, they say uh, with the, with the, with the uh, t-shirts and other stuff that they sell for merchandise, they actually put it on their website. This date is you wear your white. This date is you wear your gold. This date is you wear your blue. <laughs> so yeah. this 80,000 fans in the stands, they all want to look like a team. Mm -hmm. It drives ticket sales now because people want to be there at the game where they're, you know, wearing this uh, shirt or that shirt from their favorite shirt era. Have you ever seen um, a Tennessee volunteer football game where they they have it, the, the seats marked? So if you're in a certain seat, you wear white. And if the you're checkerboard. Certain, you know, oh, yeah, you're kidding. Right. Yeah, it's I really, bet, it's that really is cool. Well done. Games well done. A few times. Well done. I've been at Tennessee games a few times scouting for the uh, Gator Bowl. It's very well done. I mean, you can, there's always some that aren't following it, but when you have a sea of checkerboard, it doesn't matter. It really works. Yeah, it is. The, the checkerboard's really cool, even on the field. Uh, it's, it's anything that's singular and tasteful, it's, it's great. So the other thing I wanted to throw out there, just because I'm going to do it in uh, the chapter's name, so that's all of us. So, oh, yeah. Is, is the, um, outreach to the colleges I've been telling you about. And I have seven of them that I have targeted in this area. It's Bethune-Cookman, Edward Waters, Flagler, which is South uh, St. Augustine, Jacksonville University, UNF, and two uh, junior colleges, FSCJ and St. John's River State College. And I thought, um, aside from, you know, reaching out and doing, offering tutoring and mentoring to students in the study hall area for student athletes, um, of having, and one of the other schools did it, I think two years ago, is doing like an essay contest, inviting the kids or having a, a contest between these seven schools where they would write an essay about um, a certain individual. And, and I would like it to be Dick Lundy, not the guy that we named, not Pop Lloyd that we named the chapter after, but Dick Lundy, who was a, probably a close second to, to Lloyd, yeah. maybe third or fourth among greatest shortstops in the Negro League era. Um, he's also a person who, the record is choppy, but they believe he went to Edward Waters College when it was a high school in this, in this area, and that he went to the forerunner of Bethune-Cookman, which was 
Cookman Institute and they merged with some other school and became Bethune Cookman. But it's alleged that he went to Cookman Institute College for a year or so before um, being swooped up and taken up to Atlantic City um, by the Bacharach, uh, the mayor of Atlantic City that basically bought the Duval Giants and took them up there, started his career. And he stayed there a little longer. Pop Lloyd was there for a time, but he was sort of a drifter. Um, every two or three years, he'd play on a different team. So he played on many teams, but um, to see if, uh, you know, we could get some, at least in those two schools, Waters and Bethune-Cookman, um, you know, they're talking about an alumnus of their school and not a lot of, like I said, the record of where he went to school is a little choppy. If they could find out anything about that, it'd be great. But um, I'm working on with uh, Scott Carter, who does the discounting and the student uh, rate after provide proof that they're a student, uh, ran the idea by him just to see what the mechanics were of that. And he thought it was a great idea. He said, let me know how many people you uh, you think will will go. So the first thing I want to reach out to not only the baseball teams, but with the uh, Kim Ng thing, yeah, Kim Ng being appointed a general manager of the Marlins, um, I thought I can't really ignore the softball teams at these schools either, because now um, Ng has opened up, you know, the possibility that uh, girls who are students in sport management could have a career path in baseball. Now, there was a the Giants, I think, first base coach was a woman. I'm not sure what her other duties were. They're usually a hitting coach or a pitching coach or something like that. I th and there's a strength and conditioning coach, I think, for the Phillies or some other team. So now I guess the, the glass ceiling has been broken for women in Major League Baseball and Minor League Baseball and all that. So when I reach out to these schools, it's not only going to be baseball coaches, it'll be softball coaches. With COVID and stuff, I get, you know, that um, people are reticent to do much of anything. And there's a lot of inertia out there and aside from fear and not apathy. I don't want to say apathy. I think people would be excited about this type of project. The Waters coach was, and I think UNF, they would be. Um, I just wondered if I, if I was too late getting it out there. Um, you're never something. too late. If you're talking, yeah. about, you're talking about making appearances and and you know and, and doing mentoring and stuff like that uh, you're never too late but i just want what, kids to submit um assignments i'll look them over and grade them just you know put a cursory grade uh on them and maybe we could do it by committee Lidra has offered to help if anyone else wants to look at a few and and we could do some sort of um wisdom of the crowd because god knows i don't have enough wisdom to light a light bulb so i need all the help i can get um I would, not I, worry. Enjoy. I, would, I would not worry about um, leaving somebody out at this point. I think there's no reason why you have to limit yourself to doing it once. Yeah. So, oh, it would be an annual thing, I hope. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, like you do it once with the, with the group you're able to make connections with, and you keep trying to make more connections the next time the group is bigger. Uh, but what would what, I don't understand what you're proposing about Lundy? That he'd be the topic, so we'd give them, okay, you know, the like, topic. All right. yeah. did okay. you know anything of it? Like, sort of, I want to know what his Q score, what his recognition. I don't think Pop Lloyd uh, would have a Q rating of more than five in this city, which is obscene because he lived here in this city and he's in the Hall of Fame. He's in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Dick Lundy, who was a lifetime resident, lifetime citizen of this city of Jacksonville, I, th I would guess his Q rating is zero. Because you go to the ballparks, and I, I get Buck O'Neill was an icon and, and really brought the Negro Leagues uh, to the forefront with uh, uh, Ken Burns, I think, the documentary. And he was instrumental in setting up the uh, Negro League Museum in Kansas City. I get it. But you could put Dick Lundy or you could put Pop Lloyd next to his uh, statue at, at J.P. Small's Park. Um, which is where they would have played in Durkeyville, um, which is, you know, maybe a hop, skip, and a jump away from the Jumbo Shrimps uh, ballpark. Um, I think Lundy's address that I found and Pop Lloyd's address in Jacksonville 
is where the FSCJ campus is right near the Jumbo Shrimp Stadium. It was leveled. Whatever neighborhood was there was leveled. One of their houses is still standing or, or the neighborhood is still standing. It's by the turnpike. But the other one, I think, is, has been leveled and is now FSCJ. So, I mean, those guys were citizens of this city and have a Q rating of zero. That's obscene to me. So are, are you proposing some kind of uh, scholarship or prize or just the no, the pri <laughs> no, the prize would be the, the and, and I think Scott, Scott suggested, suggested this, this their, their virtual, virtual conference, conference in January would be one because it's, you know, it, I think it's $50 to sign up for that and you get a year's free membership, which is $25 for students. So they bundled that. So I would say, you know, first prize gets that as a prize if they want it. You know, they, the virtual thing, yeah, you hear it live, but eventually they rack it and it's up there and it's, and the value goes to zero real quick. But could we also, could we also post their essay and, you know, recognize them? Yes. The yeah, okay. yeah right. that's one of the conditions I'm writing in is that we would use either excerpts or the full thing, um, depending on how good the essays are. Yeah. You know, if we put it together and, um, you know, produce it, not for, you know, maybe for our chapter, but for Sabre in general, but we'd have to get permission, I guess, from the authors, but that's going to be well, a just even precondition see, for I mean, it's typical in these contests, say, uh, you can use you know, all or some. The property yeah. becomes the property, yes. you know, but, but I think part of the incentive for them to do it, if one, one possible incentive is if they get some class credit for it, but also... Yeah. Also, uh, uh, that would probably be the biggest incentive, but the other would be just notoriety on uh, on social media. Yeah. You know, if they're, oh no, we'll they're promote that. Names there with a figure of blue a ribbon, resume you know, and filler. All Absolutely, I think membership in Saber is. I, I mean, yeah. it's on mine. I I don't know that it's an interesting um, talking point, you know, and it shows that you have. A little depth and breadth regardless if you're especially if you're sport management i think you need stuff like like a membership um to show that you you have diverse interests yeah. other than yeah. just you know uh, to your flipping hot dogs yeah at the ballpark and then shutting the doors and you know locking the gates at night and i'm not saying that's the impression of most sport management um kids but it already you know faces the well that's the toy department of you know if you're in into the marketing side yeah i really want someone who majored in marketing not sport management which is mine with a minor in marketing because eh, you know sport management that's the playground we want some serious folks here we're hard driven you know you get that you get that as uh in sport management for sure i'm certain of it <laughs> so yeah i mean it's not i'm just not knowledgeable about it well and, and baseball players especially among um uh student athletes kids that have an athletic scholarship i don't know that they're that much higher higher regarded than um basketball or football players if it's if it is it's not by much i don't think it's by much so anything they could do to you know to broaden their horizons and have something you know, meaningful to put on their resumes, then that'd be great too. Well, uh, you know, if you were hoping there would be more name recognition for guys like Lundy and Lloyd, I mean, first recognition is that these guys played before current college students' grandfathers were born. Yeah. You know, so you, that, that's asking a lot. Yeah, unless, no, I know. I unless get it. the city had made a point of, you know, with statues and annual recognitions and things like that, then, you know, it, it can become and in, get into your consciousness without any effort on your part. Mm -hmm. You yeah, have I mean, to be a real student of baseball history to know Negro League stars from the 10s and the 20s and 30s. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I sure don't. And but that's the assignment of the essay is to come yeah, up with right, right. quotes to learn some. Yeah, subjective quotes from either peers or coaches <clears throat> as to who this guy was comparable to. Because it's like real estate. It's comparable. You know, when they talk about a player, they say from different eras. They say, well, he was like 
this guy today. You have to be able to make that point of comparison so that people get a, a mental picture of who the guy was and whether that's like a physiological, well, he was 6'2", 180, 180 pound short, uh, maybe let's say 6'4", 210 pound shortstop. Well, you would say he was Ripken-esque, you know, Cal Ripken was a big shortstop, eventually moved to third base. So put together something like that. Then if they could do a statistical profile, maybe I'm asking too much, but you know, with war, you could say, well, this guy is ranked, you know, just a tad below this guy who's in the hall of fame. As far it's as the not Negroes, asking too much because oh, no, it's all on baseball nowadays. reference. Absolutely. It's all on baseball reference. You not and only can heads. find the statistics, but at the bottom of their page, you'll see the comps. Yeah. Of what they were most like, who they were most like statistically. But Glenn, you and I know that, but we're not going to be in the contest. We're we're disqualified for being Saber members. So well, these are kids on, now. No, you and I are not in the them, contest. Though. But if we want, <laughs> point. I guess the question would be: Is how much help do you want to give them? On here's a way to start. Uh, we're still going to reward the writing, right? Yeah, I think I've drafted research. the hints. I said cite every. Um, source you use, yeah. but baseball reference and seam heads does not have to be cited because that's, okay. that's how we do the bio project and uh, um, the games project that those, yeah. if you're talking statistics, it's a given that it came from one or the other and you just source that as a, as a statistical source. So I'd prefer seam heads to, cause they do the Negro league stuff better than baseball reference, baseball reference. You have to shop around and really, you know, go to three or four different pages and it, it, it's mind numbing for me and seam heads, it's right there. They have the comps and everything. And yep. given that, I mean, of all the guys who've been elected and there's supposed to be another election in 2021, um, the top 25 or 30 slots in terms of war, lifetime war, as they calculate it, are in and guess who's, well, there's one guy, Dick Redding, a pitcher, believe it or not, is up there ahead of one. Cannonball then, Redding. Yes, sir. And <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're up to speed. You're probably ahead of me. Um, and then comes Dick Lundy. And they may say, well, we have enough shortstops, but there's another one. Actually, Dobie Moore is right. You know, the best guy mm -hmm. plays shortstop and center field and catcher. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I know there's probably another guy or two, and they're going to want to get, you know, Mini Minoso in, and they want to – uh, get Buck O'Neill in. That's two slots. I think I told you of, um, you know, when somebody asked, I think it was Mark Armour, the uh, question at one of the uh, uh, the virtual Sabre conference this year. So, well, how many is enough? Well, what's the number? And he said, well, you know, back in the day, that was, uh, Negroes were 10% of the population. You would say, well, and 10% of what the Hall of Fame from that era should be um, – uh, ex Negro leaguers. And I don't think that's, that's the comp you would use because like I said, I think, I think I said in one of the other meetings is if you, if you look at anyone's list of the top hundred players of all time, um, black players are 25% of it or 20% of it. I get that their population now is, or their demographic is 13% of the population, but given the opportunity, but for the, but for argument, which they use in, uh, in court, you know, to determine guilt or innocence, you know, but for uh, Jim Crow, how many guys from that era would have been in the hall, in your hall of fame, but for not being able to play uh, with and against Babe Ruth and Walter Johnson and, you know, all those guys, um, how many would have, well, my guess would be the same proportion that is now 20 or 25, because regardless of the population, a number of players, how many reach greatness? And that's, you know, that's a tough um, metric to, to fudge. I mean, you could say well, you're talking about 20 or 25 percent of, of the players in anybody's top 100 all time. Bill James, any Tom Tango. Oh, I see what you mean. OK. Yeah. Okay. And that's without participation for half of the years. You know, so let's just say that it's 20 to 25 percent all of all time. So you could take from 46, 1900 to 1946 and say, well, how many um, 
how many white players were in the Hall of Fame up until 1946. And you really have to go past that because it's guys who were playing in 46 weren't even eligible till 56. And maybe they didn't finish their career till 56 and then another 10 years or five years sit out. So 1950. So how many players, white players exclusively were in the Hall of Fame from 1900 to 1950? Because I don't even know who the first um, African-American Hall of Famer uh, voted in was. But it would have had to have been in the 70s, 60s, late 60s or 70s. But from 1900 to 1950, it was zero African-Americans. So how many um, Negro League players played and, and how many white players were there in the Hall of Fame? Well, you probably have to and it wouldn't be 20% of that total, it would be a number that would make their number 20% of the W number, the white players number. So if the NW was 200, um, if you only add 40, and this is the calculation somebody did, said, okay, well, 20% or 10% would be 20. No, it wouldn't, because then that would be 20 out of a population of 220. That would only be like 9%. It has to be like 22 or 23 or 20. And it's split, it may seem like splitting hairs, but to the one guy who's next on the list, if you say, well, it should be 37 or it should be 40, number 41 is going to be pissed off that you didn't say it should be 42 or 43. Well, that's going to be true in any ranking, you know. I get I it. Mean, Somebody's you know, left whoever, on the curve. Whoever is next, yep. you know, I was going to say I should be there. Well, it's like – it's like when you talk about the top uh, teams in uh, in college football or sure. something, you know, say, well, if the playoff is 16 teams, whoever's number 17 is going to say, I've been denied a shot at the national championship. Oh, yeah. Except that, except that if you're 17th, you probably did not have a real shot at the national oh, championship. Oh, no. <laughs> my, my original thing was 10%, the 10% number. And I, I long-winded it to death so that we, we forgot the, the initial yeah. argument was 10% is ridiculously low. I think that's what the Well, the methodology round. will always be subjective. Yeah, but yeah. it can't be wrong. It can't be just obscenely off. It's yeah, the, uh, the... Well, you know, you had... You have a population, you have the percentage of a certain population, but then you also have a certain number of how many are playing ball, you know, and. But for, and but for that the gate was using, closed. If you're, using their, if you're using their stats, what's the competition, you know. But for Jim subjective, Crow. Subjective stuff. But yeah. for Jim Crow, but for closing well, but the for gate. Jim Crow, yes, but. I okay, know. So, yes, you, you, take, you take the very top and you say, sure. Satchel but that's what they did. Uh, that's what they did. And that's not, it wasn't sufficient, though. All right. It so when, who's going to do the voting this time in 2021? The, the Hall of Fame. This, uh, well, it's a special committee, whatever special committee. And Heafy, I think, was on the original one. Because it was Sabre and people who did it. Yes. It was Sabre people did it last time. Well, because what, they did the statistical analysis that said, well, this guy is equivalent to this guy. They put all the data together, just like all the guys put, you know, the Laman database and all the other uh, baseball reference guy put all those. Well, and that ended up being all like seventeen together. people or something, didn't it? Sure, ended up being like seventeen people that was oh, elected yeah. into the Hall of Fame. Yeah. All right. So at the time that happened, Bill James was so upset by that number being so high. It wasn't high. He said, "We'll never people. get a chance to do that again. It'll never be entrusted to us." He was uh, wrong. He was proven wrong, though. Yeah. Well, I mean, clearly. And he says a lot and of crazy things. I that like him. To, he says some outrageous deserve, things. Well, more more players than that from the Negro Leagues deserve to be in the Hall of Fame, no question. Yeah. The, I think his I think his point of view was given a chance, electing seventeen people all at once, you know, looked excessive to say the least. And when they when they do these statistics, white is just not black. I mean, where do Latinos fall in? And, and Japanese players and all of that. Well, now it's easier because I, I, I know um, when Mark did his baseball demographics and they had to go back to the 40s and determine, they, they were looking at things like baseball cards, pictures in the newspaper, which were obviously black and white. And it was hard to get at what, um, um, whether the person was black and white or uh, really was more white and Latino, I think, the struggle they had. Mm. Um, 
I asked him at one of the Sabre conference how, how he did that. He said, Mark Levitt, I think, did most of the legwork on that or the heavy lifting on that. But he said it was a lot of, um, you know, trying to find old baseball cards or programs and find a picture that, that they could make a determination. And, you know, sometimes with surnames, it was an educated guess, you know, based on that. Um, whether it was a Hispanic surname or something, um, and they and they they had to make a decision one way or the other, and it was more likely this than that. They went with this. Is <laughs> that's how he explained it? But it was a lot of it was a lot of research work for, you know, sort of like trying to find the end career of John Henry Johnson, the post baseball career. Sometimes you you found uh, something readily, and sometimes it was a struggle to find something. Sure. But I think when in doubt, or if they had nothing, I think they left it. Uh, it was a white person. It was more likely than not a white person because that's where the numbers were. That's how they were skewed. Uh, for any of you who play Stratomatic, have you ever seen the Stratomatic Negro Stars? Stuff? We have it, and we still have to play. Oh, it's tremendous fun. Um, and in fact, I was involved. We can't hear you, Lydra. That's probably, nah, she's muted, muted herself. Well, I was in, because when you're talking or I'm talking, it's coming through. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, we bought, he bought the Negro League one and he, every time I say I want to play it, he's like, no, 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 not yet, not yet. <laughs> so I, every couple of weeks I say, let's play it. And he's always, no, not yet. Okay, but here's what I did. Here's what I did do, and this is why the delay, because I put all the cards in with the teams, and it's a certain year. It's the the best teams in theory of of all time, up because um, I think it goes up to about the 40s. So they yeah. had the dead ball era, the tens, and then the 40s. There's a Popoloid card, but no Dick Lundy. So they have the teams. So I looked at each of these teams, and I looked at seam heads, and I sorted by who had the best winning percentage. Um, of a large sample size of of the teams. And so they were roughly the top, there's eight teams in there. So I did categorize them by a first seed and an eight seed and a second seed. And, and I set up a turn. So I have the bracket set up yeah. based on their Some winning percentage. percentage. So, so I get Lloyd's team first and then she can pick the next team and we'll, we're gonna do the bracket and we're gonna have a little tournament. It's going to be you know, it sounds like sounds like you have an affliction that that uh, many of us have, and that is it's so much fun organizing your yes. project. You never get around to playing it. Thank exactly. you. Exactly. <laughs> you say you that, Glenn, like it's a good game. thing. Thank you. Yeah. Somebody way, in this Lundy, house does Dick not Lundy believe is, that. Dick Lundy is in the set. Which one? Not the in one the, I bought. Ne in the Negro League set. No. Dick Lundy is in that set. Which team? Well, the computer, the computer, which I'm looking at now, has the players divided into four teams. Okay. Detroit, Kansas City, Pittsburgh, Washington. Right. Which is not a formal affiliation, but he's on the Detroit team. Oh. Um, Pop Lloyd and Lundy are both on the same team. So. Yeah, they, they did cross paths a, a bunch of times. With Oscar Charleston on that team. Loaded. Luke Foster, Judy Johnson. Uh, these I'm giving you the biggest names. Well, Rube Foster appears you know, a couple Jose of times. Mendez, His teams are uh, always loaded. Smokey Joe Williams. You know, so sounds like I Kansas need to buy City another card set. Obviously, the Monarchs and Pittsburgh's Crawfords and Washington's going to have uh, Josh Gibson. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you a Stratomax story. I I took the Hall of Fame set. I took the first baseball heroes set because when I played this, there was only one. There's two now. Um, and I took the Negro Stars set with all those cards. And, you know, I wanted these guys to play. I didn't want teams to be so thick that these guys were just a whole bunch of them were sitting on the bench and never mm -hmm. getting the lineup. So I divided into 22 teams. I played like a 54 game schedule for all of the teams. And, so the first time, I, I just had some tremendous things. First game, uh, Babe Ruth, you know, 
walk off triple to complete a cycle. <laughs> nice. Uh, okay, so the first game that uh, Babe Ruth and Josh Gibson played against each other, because four of the 22 teams were Negro League teams. I decided they would all be played together mm-hmm. as teams and see how competitive they could be with Hall of Famers. And the other oh, girls. yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, the answer, by the way, was the Monarchs were pretty competitive. The others were not as competitive. Um, you know, there were other teams, Boston and, you know, some others that just did a lot better. But anyway, the Yankees, so Babe Ruth, I had the Yankees divided into two franchises, the older Yankees and the more modern Yankees. So there's so many Yankees in those sets. And so first game between the Yankees and the Homestead team is the Yankees, the old Yankees were up first and Ruth had a first inning home. And the Homestead team, Josh Gibson had a first inning homer to match. Nice. The next time Ruth came up, you know, home run. <laughs> next time Gibson came up, Gibson had a home run. <laughs> nice. <laughs> End of the game, Gibson actually hit a third homer and his team won. Nice. And I thought, you know, if that had happened in real life, we would still be talking about it so, today. Exactly. The first time Ruth and Gibson went head to head, the black. Babe Ruth and mm-hmm. you know and they had this titanic battle of one-upsmanship and uh Gibson hit three and Ruth hit two you know matching homers matching homers and then bang a winner that's cool now you, uh, now I have to get more sets and match that well it, you take me back that um Seamheads database the other reason I like base that over baseball reference <clears> is <throat> in their stats they do have I think how a guy did um, in the Negro League aff- affiliated teams and how well they did against the barnstorming teams, the white teams, when they played against them. Well, and you're going to be right. The seam heads, you're going to be right. The seam heads is a better source. I just went to oh. baseball reference. And when oh, I oh yeah, yeah. did they a just search on Dick Lundy or Pop Lloyd, they don't even pop up, you know, so, so to speak. They, so, will, uh, they should now. I think they, they've loaded most of them, if not all of them. But well, that was if fairly I, recent. If I type in Dick Lundy, Richard I don't Lundy. get anything. Try you know, I, have to, I have to do a specific search on him rather than just typing in his name and having his name. Yeah, pop try up. Richard. They may, they may go proper name or just the last name. No, they usually don't. In fact, here, Dick Lundy. Okay, now I call He was there. Him. And here's the stuff. Here's the yeah, stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> now, what do they call his comps? It's, I don't think it's here. Seam heads. Comps on him. seam heads will have it. So seam heads would be the one. Yeah, That'd baseball be reference does run. not. Which I think is cool because you see, I think Lloyd did better in uh, uh, intramural competition than, I guess, intra. And I think Lundy was the opposite, but not by, not by much. Well, I've talked too much, so let some other people talk. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> me too, probably. Joseph, are you still something. there? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're good. We're good. I'm actually very impressed with both of you. It's amazing. It's very, it's... I'm still here. <laughs> right, so what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts? What do you hear from some of the other groups? What are we doing wrong? What are we doing right? Uh, I, oh, I think you, you keep great communication, which is good. Um, you know, a lot of emails. You're a member of several clubs, is that it? Yeah, I, I am. <laughs> yeah, I thought so I was I'm, when I first started this, and I especially the committees and the other stuff. I said I'm in way too many, and I think my better half here probably said it more eloquently than I than I could. Um, and I I see some other guys that that have have me beat by a mile, and now I feel like mm-hmm. a slug. <laughs> well, I, I, I've really enjoyed like the Zoom, um, you know, and, you know, obviously once um, the COVID situation, however yeah. you call it, and, and the Zoom and the more face-to-face come back in place, mm-hmm. then I'll be able to, you know, like I wouldn't be able to come down to... You know, Not from Baltimore? Florida. <laughs> you know, the national conventions up there, we're going to see you there. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. 
Because I, I know we're going up there. I, I think that we've talked among, in a couple of meetings, and I know Charlie and I have talked uh, about this, but even I think after COVID's over, I think that we'll probably do um, an occasional, maybe one uh, personal meeting and one Zoom meeting a month. Yeah, we'll start it's just, it, yeah, it's just, it really is really easy to join a zoom meeting you don't want to do it every time because it's nice to go out and visit but mm -hmm. at the same time um people from outside the area can visit when you do a zoom meeting uh mm -hmm. you don't have to go anywhere if the weather's crappy um mm -hmm. it's it there there are just times when you want to conduct business um, and that's sometimes hard to do in some locations where there's a lot of people and noise going around. So I, I think that we'll probably end up as a, as a group meeting uh, Zoom probably four to six times a year at least. Because mm -hmm. we're about 50-50 people from this area and people from outside. Sometimes, Sometimes people, people from the neighbor, uh, from the home office in Phoenix, pop in like they did last week, and you know, give mm -hmm. us some information and things like that. And I guess there's a push to get, you know, some of the people that are in the other groups, you know, to um, pop in to, to other groups meetings and you know, keep in touch, see what other people are doing. The mm -hmm. um, essay contests, and we did a. Um, a draft a draft challenge where we invited kids mainly it was it was something I was again doing with the schools to kind of grade them against like the the talking heads and the draft experts the Mel Kuypers of baseball and so mm -hmm. I just lifted their final projection which you know is like generally the day before the draft and then the kids would submit um, something on a spreadsheet and Actually, everybody, I know, I know everybody's, you know, clipping and reading and doing composites of, well, this guy says this and this guy says this, why don't I just split the difference? But they ended up being uh, as good or better than the, the experts. It just shows the interest and the, inf the amount of information that's out there nowadays as compared to other days. But the kids like that one, I think, because they, you know, they do it in football and they do it in basketball. The draft is one of the, you know, one of the biggest you know, drawing in of interest of people who may be sort of, you know, still casual fans, but it gets them, gets them hooked. Right. Yeah. I'd like to see who the next, the next big thing is. <laughs> True. So we're, yeah. I, I, I've specifically been focused trying to get like young people involved. So we'll see if next year, since this is the last meeting of this year and Merry Christmas, Happy New Year and stay safe <laughs> and enjoy the holidays. And, uh, because uh, we'll see everybody in 2021, um, I suppose, except Mary. We might see her before 2020 ends. But, yeah. But this is just sort of what we did this year and, you know, what we hope to do next year. And I'm going to put it down on paper here. I, we're at 20 right now. We started with, what was it, eight, Glenn? Eight people? Were... Yeah, seven or eight. Okay. Seven or eight. No, but that was with, yeah, that was with the home office too. I think the original boat that left the shore was uh, was eight. Uh, I seem to recall eight. So we're at 20. So I'll say from 10 to 20, roughly. Let's double our size by next year. By this time <laughs> next year, we'll be at 40. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Well, yeah, it should should work out that way, hopefully. We'll see. But I would like that. Famous last words, right? Thank you. But that's the stage we're in. We're trying to grow. We're new, obviously. I, I know you probably remembered from when you joined. Um, we're less than a year old. So and we were mm -hmm. born in the COVID. So we're going to come out of it like the Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. when, when did it start, Charlie? I think we started in April. I want to say April was... The, probably the first meeting or first yeah and I only did it because I was so bored sitting around the house and I saw this thing and I said we were talking about meetings and I said um she's 
in the Orlando group, we were both Sabre members for years, but she was in Orlando and, and we were talking about, well, why are you in Orlando? And have you ever gone to a meeting? And she said, no. And so well, have you ever gone to Tallahassee? And I said, I passed through Tallahassee if you never went to a meeting, but I'd like to. And we kind of thought, well, wouldn't it be great if there was one here? And so we looked it up. She said, well, stop talking about it and do something. Yeah, you know wives are. That's what they do. <laughs> so she kicked me in the butt and said, well, do something. And so I don't have to hear your you chatter. Go. And there you go. so I just did one thing and I thought, wow, they're going to shoot it down and then I won't have to do it anymore. I can stay in the Tallahassee group. No, I really wanted it to, I did want it to work. Yeah. Absolutely. It's good for us to have a port here. Well, I'm going to need to break off here. All right. I've yeah, we're my budgeted time, but it's enjoyable as always. So you guys keep going. Have fun. But that's the plan. Thank you. All right. I know you'll stay in touch. Take you care. Bet. Bye -bye. All right. Thanks for joining us, Joseph. Don't be a stranger. I won't. I won't. And yeah, and again, thanks for the emails and that kind of thing. Like I said, uh, kind of a general fan. Yeah, you know, I mean, obviously. Yeah. Let us know if you if you think there's something other other groups, especially young ones like us, are doing that, that you say, well, this could help you guys as you get to know the characters. <laughs> I certainly will. I certainly will. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your efforts. So. Okay, bye-bye, everybody. All right, good night. Stay safe. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I forgot where the closed meeting is, but eventually it just kind of closes itself. I'm the only one in it.